The immune system is our defence mechanism, providing robust protection against invading foreign bodies. But some of us seem to be a lot more susceptible to getting sick than others. Is this just because those people are slightly oversensitive, or could they in fact have a weakened immune system? We hear a lot about how to boost our immunity, by eating the right things, sleeping the right amount, avoiding stress. But how do these external factors affect our immune system? The immune system is part of our overall physiology and although we tend to think about the immune system as a separate system, it's actually integrated with our hormonal system, our neurological system. So actually our bodies work as a coordinated, coordinated set of lots of different systems of which the immune system concentrates on recognising foreign things and and infectious agents but actually it works with other systems so if you're very stressed for example that can influence how your immune system works so I think that there are things you can do you need to be in good health and you need to try and keep stress free. There's not really a very clear cut story about diet and the immune system however certain aspects of diet are important so for example um, things like vitamin A are very important for various immune cell function in the gut and um, bile acids are important for immune cell function in the gut and your diet affects your microbiota which is your gut bacteria and your gut bacteria are very important for your immune response. Here in Manchester, there's a lot of people working on, on, on interactions between the nervous system and uh, the immune system. One of the things that's very common is the signaling molecules that operate in both these systems. So these signaling chemical messengers called cytokines. The same cytokines operate both on nerve cells and immune cells and many cells in each sort of system also make these cytokines. So they have, they operate through receptors that are expressed on cells and so you can automatically see how cytokines that can operate in the immune system can also operate on cells of the, the nervous system. And it, it's trying to understand how you get that coordinated response that determines how we deal with infection. Our immune system also has an adaptive capacity, allowing us to hold a memory of the infectious agents we've encountered. In the late 18th century, it was noticed that milkmaids who had been infected by cowpox became immune to the deadly smallpox virus. Then, during the 1774 epidemic, Dorset farmer Benjamin Jesty inoculated his wife and two children by scratching their arms with the pus of an infected cow. They recovered from the resulting cowpox infection and never contracted smallpox. His bold move inspired further work in the field leading to Edward Jenner developing the first vaccine a few years later. But Jesty was considered inhumane and immoral for infecting his family with animal pus. The family was ostracised from the community, with rumours circulating that they were turning into horned beasts. Now, almost 250 years on, and there is still a large cohort of campaigners who strongly believe vaccines are highly dangerous. These beliefs are not based upon scientific evidence and pose a danger to all of us. But how do vaccines work and how could the ignorance of just a few people put all of us at risk? Really by the time vaccines get to, to people um, they are not dangerous, they're not dangerous at all. So what, what happens with your immune response is when you meet a germ, a pathogen for the first time is you have a very rapid response to it which we call the innate immune response and that will try and control some of the damage that that pathogen's doing and try and stop that pathogen spreading too much. However, it's not specific. So this then talks, this innate immune system then talks to another part of your immune system, which we call the adaptive immune system. And these are your T cells and your B cells or your T lymphocytes and your B lymphocytes. And what they do is they have memory and they respond very specifically to that pathogen and they will remember it. So if you meet a pathogen again later in life and you've had it before you have that immune memory which means you will have a very rapid and a very specific immune response to it so that would be the natural way that you would then develop immunity to an infection and what a vaccine is doing is it's trying to mimic that so by giving you either a little piece of, a, of one of the germs or something that looks like one of the germs we are able to trigger 
the immune response into developing memory, which means that you are then protected from that infection later on. So obviously that tends to be safer than actually having the infection, particularly if it's a, a nasty infection. So some vaccines will have side effects, just like uh, any medication that you take. If you take your pills out and have a look at them, there's a whole list of side effects. I mean, most of the time that doesn't happen. And for vaccinations, most people respond in, in, in the expected way and it protects you against often deadly disease. So yes, they are they're fantastic when they work, but that doesn't negate the effect that you have on individuals. And that's probably down to individual circumstances, your host genetics, and how you're feeling at the time that you're vaccinated. But I think vaccination is actually a goal that we should aim for for most infectious disease, because when it works well, it's cheap, it's very effective, and it's often long lasting. So the idea of herd immunity is, is if you've got lots of people in a population um, that are vaccinated, they are immune to infection and the, and the germ can't spread, so the germ will ultimately die out. If you don't have enough people that have the vaccine, then the germ can spread. And this is what's happened with measles. People became very nervous about the measles vaccine um, because of some research which has been shown to be wrong um, and they stopped having the measles vaccine they stopped having the mmr vaccine and now lots of people don't have the measles vaccines for something that was actually on the verge of being eradicated is coming back because this is a very infectious disease and if you've got lots of people who aren't vaccinated it jumps very easily from person to person um, and it's sort of an example of herd immunity kind of going wrong unfortunately the vast majority of the scientific community agree that vaccines pose no significant health risk by the time they are being produced for human prescription. But one thing that is not so obvious is the case of the increasing incidence of allergic and autoimmune disease in the Western world. What we have noticed in, in the West, in Western civilizations, is and the developed countries, is that there suddenly seems to be an increase in new diseases like allergies and autoimmune diseases. And these are diseases where your immune system is not working properly, it's going wrong. So in an allergy, what's happening is the immune system is reacting to something harmless that you should be ignoring. And in an autoimmune disease, what the immune system do, is doing is it's basically reacting to something in your body. And because it's part of you, you can't get rid of it. So you have what we call a long-term or a chronic reaction. And that's why autoimmune diseases last in the way that they do. So people have wondered why we get more of these diseases now in the West. And some people think it's because we are much cleaner. So a chap called Strachan, he um, noticed that in rural environments, so in the country, um, there were less allergies and autoimmune diseases. And in places um, where there was large family groups, so if you had a large family, you're also less likely to get an allergy. So he suggested that was because you were getting more interaction with germs at a young age that was training your immune system, so you were less likely to develop the allergy. We're not exposed to as many infectious agents of all types as we would have naturally evolved to do. And therefore, because our immune system isn't constantly being challenged, by all these infectious agents, then our, I, I think our immunoregulatory system, i.e. the way in which we regulate how our immune system works, is not as effective as it might be. So in countries where they get a lot of exposure to lots of different kinds of infectious agents, right from an early age, our immune system learns to set a balance up and a degree of how we regulate our immune system so that it doesn't become overzealous or overactive against both our own cells and innocuous agents such as pollen or, or house dust mite. In the countries that still have worms, worm infections, allergies and autoimmune diseases are quite rare, whereas the countries that have eradicated worms, like the UK, we obviously have a lot of these diseases, so people are now wondering if it's something to do with worms and if worms can be beneficial. So this is an area of active research. People are looking at how worm infections 
can be can be used to help people so there are clinical trials ongoing to to look at the beneficial possibilities of, of having a worm infection. There's a black market in it, so people deliberately infect themselves with worms, which can be risky because you don't know what you're getting, it's expensive, and worm infections do cause disease. I mean, we have got rid of them for a reason. And then in Manchester, there's quite a lot of interest in looking at worm products and trying to understand better how the worm is affecting the immune system and if there's things about that that we can then use to help treat other diseases that are common.